That's right. What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Bridging the Gap here on the Jersey First TV Network. As always, I'm AJ Malillo. And I'm Stephen Rombolo. And how are we doing, Stephen? Another week in the books. Another week of your first year of law school. Yeah, I, literally in the books. I think that's <laughs> where I spend most of my time for the past uh, seven days since we last convened. Um, but I'll tell you what. It paid off, man. I took my first uh, quiz today in the infamously dreaded civil procedure class, and I pulled out some magic, man. I, I far and away am sitting above the average. Uh, I'm even above the upper quartile uh, in, in terms of score. So started this class off. Uh, I only have three graded assessments in here, so this is a – insanely great leg up I have on getting that good GPA, getting that good class rank and everything that I need to put myself in the best position to be where I want to be, uh, you know, next year and eventually later on in life. So just an affirmation, I guess, that the hard work, the dedication, the sacrifice, the commitment, you know, blah, 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 all those things, uh, it's paying off in, in dividends. It feels good. It Absolutely. feels good. So proud of you. Uh, I think I speak for not just me, but everybody listening. That's awesome. And uh, just keep it up. Keep grinding. That's it, man. But uh, I know I know you're busy working on uh, your, your big project over there still for that case. I know you're a bit of, way, bit of ways away from it, but, but still putting uh, it in work. So. Not really. It's like a month out. So, <laughs> like, it um, feels right, like a well, far time away, but it's really comes up a lot quicker than you want it to. Um so yeah, I got I got that big project going on. I got all of the other classes, but you know what? Overall, overall school wise, things are going pretty well. Um, and yeah, you just you just juggling life in school and trying to do its best. I, I I got a little bit of like a I don't know a little little bit of a cold right now. I think or or something along those lines. Um, so you know, just juggling all of those things. But we're gonna be all right. We're making it through. We made it through the week. Thankfully, and uh, <laughs> I'm just rocking and rolling at this point, I guess. I, you know That's what, it. Steve? We we could talk about this really briefly because we do have a, a tight window for time today. Um, but I think we would be remiss to not mention the tragedy that that happened in MetLife <laughs> on Monday. Um, I was at the bar with my brother and our friend, and and Aaron Rodgers goes down, and I just, you know what, it's exactly the thing that would happen to the new york jets like I, I don't know what to say other than i'm distraught i'm in shambles my life feels like it has fallen apart before my <laughs> eyes it, it, my mental state for the next 20 weeks pretty much rested on that man's achilles and it snapped so yeah. i don't know what i'm gonna do yeah it did i listen I, so i was i that particular game, that Monday game, I was busy. I, I that's one of my busier days in school. I have some, you know, obligations, commitments to fitness afterwards. So I, I was actively training in the gym when the game started. I remember I said, "Send me a video of the first Aaron Rodgers play as a Jet." You know, it's, it's going to be this poetic, incredible moment. And I, I kid you not, I want to say probably within five minutes after it happened. I must have had like nine separate messages, whether it be like Instagram DM, somebody sent me a video somewhere like losing their minds. And I, I was so in the zone. I'm, I'm like in my space when I'm in the gym. I saw the first snap and I was like, that's all I need to see. He's a jet. That's my guy carrying it on. And then, you know, the, the news really settled. And I, I think I, we said this last time, we're not a sports podcast, but I think this is important for me to just say, like in terms of a sports injury, I can't imagine or, or perceive of, at least in my lifetime, somebody whose career, you know, has had so many ups and downs, has been so, you know, publicly loved and hated and vilified and glorified and, and up and down and up and down. And Aaron Rodgers really was the offseason story of the NFL. Everybody was watching. Everybody wanted to know where he was going to go. Is he going to the Jets? Is he going to retire? He lands at the Jets. They do the hard knocks. You have the crazy, like everything's going on. He makes this poetic run out of the tunnel on 9-11 with the American flag. It's, I have chills right now just thinking about it, and the Achilles got him. But great spirits, it seems, that he is in. And as he said, the night is always darkest before dawn, and he will rise again. And I'm so, calling it right now. 
MVP season after the torn Achilles. Now it, it's so awesome. Like his response to it was perfect, and yeah, yeah, I, you're absolutely right. It was, it was just disheartening. Um, but you know what? The Jets got the win. They rallied around Zach. You got to feel good about that, yeah. and, and you see what happens. You got to change expectations. You, you're not thinking Super Bowl or bust anymore. You're thinking, you know, hopefully you can sneak into the playoffs, and that would be pretty cool. But that's it. That's it. That's all I can hope for. But we got some stories to go to. We have a big news day. So, Stephen, start us off. What is going on around the world? Well, I, I would say not so much. I mean, I guess it does have worldly implications. But um, today, actually, the president's uh, son, Hunter Biden, who's been in and out of the news for many, 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 many years at this point uh, for various things, has had a federal indictment that was returned by a grand jury in Wilmington, Delaware. He was charged with three felonies, uh, lying to a federally licensed gun dealer, making a false claim on the federal firearms application, and and then it was the illegal possession of a gun for 11 days. And what I think is interesting about the 11 days is after the 11 days, um, Hallie Biden, who was the, the widow of Hunter's brother, Bo, was having an affair with Hunter Biden, and she threw that gun uh, in a dumpster, you know, after the 11 days after he had bought it because she was afraid that he was going to kill himself with it. So I think today we learned, uh, I, I mean, if you didn't know that already, that Hunter Biden was having an affair with his dead brother's wife uh, after his, his brother had died while he was addicted to alcohol and uh, narcotics and, and buying guns legally. Uh, I think it's very clear that the president's son is in quite a boatload of trouble. And this also comes on the heels of a, a failed, what was going to be a plea agreement that was going to ultimately keep Hunter Biden out of jail on these charges that, you know, for whatever reason fell through. And now we end up here and it's really uncertain uh, what it looks like. Obviously this is just an indictment. There's really been no actual procedural things that have gone on in the way of, you know, an actual trial, but I think what's interesting, too, is the penalties for this are pretty severe. He could face up to 25 years in prison and three quarters of a million dollars in fines. Uh, but I guess if you're, you know, funneling money from your job that your dad got you in Ukraine, uh, $750,000 probably isn't isn't too much to worry about. But sure. big point and of the story here. Well, I was going to say, Go it's ahead. funny you mentioned that because uh, the – the Republicans have officially announced that they will be opening an impeachment inquiry into the president of the United States, Joe Biden, for exactly what you were alluding to there. Now, I think what's interesting about that, and, and I, I have a, a Reuters story popped up, and they talk about, the, the in the first paragraph, it says, Republicans in the U.S. House of Representatives have opened an impeachment inquiry into the Democratic president, Joe Biden, after months of investigations of his son, hunter biden's foreign business dealings they have not found any evidence of misconduct by biden himself and then they go on to exactly explain the misconduct by biden himself later in the story <laughs> i so it now since both of these news are out in the in the public sphere i think just something worth noting before we give some takes on this uh what i thought was interesting i pulled up a 538 article and it, it is so bizarre to me and, and the effort of being fair and transparent, like I completely agree, you know, prima facie with the inquiry that the House Republicans have opened into President Biden. I think it's completely warranted. I think that there has been, you know, a, quite a long string of events over the course of many years that has led us to this point. And I think they're completely justified in taking this inquiry on. But 538 in their you know little article that they wrote up about this mentions that still, for some reason, a majority of Americans would be more inclined to believe that the Trump family is much more corrupt than the Biden family. And, and that, to me, I think speaks volumes about the way that media has covered these two stories, because both of these families, if I'm being honest with you, are equally as corrupt. I, I think it's, it's basically what the decision was when we voted in 2020. It's just the lesser of two evils. It's like, which corrupt old man do you want in office and that's where we're at but i think it's such a jarring uh i guess realization when you look at the especially today you know given the fact that hunter has this federal indictment with gun charges felony possessions lying to federal arms dealers while he's 
you know, again, having an affair with his dead brother's wife and like very obviously morally objectionable behavior. And for some reason, the Trump family is worse. I think that they're both uh, despicable characters, uh, unworthy of holding public office or, or being put on any sort of pedestal that could even be so much as perceived as having a degree of moral high ground, uh, let alone the presidency. So I, I you know, well, I'll just push back and say that none of the tr Trump children are accused of anything nearly close to what Hunter Biden's accused of. But so I, I will say that. Um, that being said, I, I other than that, I couldn't necessarily push back or, or, or disagree with anything more other than the fact that I, I think it's really funny how one of the impeachments that the Democrats put into into Donald Trump was a, the quid pro quo alleged between the president and, and now the darling of the Democratic Party of President Vladimir Zelensky, who at that time was was a villain of the party. You just got to keep you got to keep your character straight, right? They hated Zelensky. He was a corrupt bargainer with President Trump, but now he's the best guy ever. Um, Biden, right, pressured the Ukrainian prosecutor, uh, Viktor Shokin, who was looking into uh, fighting corruption, particularly in Burisma, which was the company that Hunter Biden was working for. And the funny thing is that Joe Biden didn't really even hide this fact. Like he was in front of a panel and there's a video. You can look it up. I don't have it pulled up right now. Uh, it's very easy to find. Basically, Joe Biden's in front of this panel and he talks about how he was telling the government, uh, the government of Ukraine to get rid of this prosecutor who was looking into Burisma because, you know, it was going to hurt his family. And then he says something along the lines of um, you should you should get rid of the prosecutor. They're like, what are you going to do about it? You're just the vice president. And he was like, yeah, but who's the president going to listen to me? So if you want your money, uh, you'll get rid of this prosecutor. So I think it's really interesting how that's exactly a quid pro quo and no Democrat, not one, not one is going to support this imbe impeachment. I'm sure of that. So, um, yeah, that's about all of the takes that I'll have. It's that it's the exact same thing. It was a projection by the Democratic Party to try and get Trump on the quid pro quo. And now they're not going to do the same thing because they're cowards without any spine, backbone or uh, a shred of decency and integrity. So, <laughs> Well, well, I think you left no meat on the bone uh, with that one. I, I think my my final perspective on it is is, listen, it's the same show. The actors are different, but the, the plot's the same. And like you said, I, I think they're both, you know, equally as as deserving of the inquiry, but also like shame on the Democrats that are going to sit here and pretend like this isn't damn near the same exact situation that they pinned Donald Trump for. Uh, if there's any Democrat who has any shred of decency or respect left in their body, they would, at least for the sake of consistency, and fairness and application in, in procedure uh, support this inquiry uh, of impeachment into President Biden, but I doubt that we get it. My hopes aren't so high for Democrats uh, at this stage of the game. That's fair. I agree. And, and we'll follow this story as it goes along, but we have to move on to our next story and bring us back to the beautiful Garden State. And so this is a story out of NJ.com, and it's about how there's a – New system being put into, uh, looking to be expanded, I should say, in Newark called ShotSpotter. Um, basically, shot, what ShotSpotter is, is it's this program where there are cameras and microphones set up that are trained to listen for gunshots. And if, if a gunshot goes off, the camera turns on into the location where the gunshot was fired um, and, and it's able to catch it before the people get away so that they so that law enforcement can use this tool to to quickly capture these these criminals that are, are shooting guns so proponents of the gunshot detection system say that it is there to help save lives and catch cr criminals by automatically alerting first responders to the time and place of shootings faster than a 911 call but critics question the value of the detection system which occasionally mistake car backfires or other booms for gunshots, supposedly saying that they can lead to over-policing of neighborhoods where their audio sensors are installed. Now, um, there were 
I, I happen to know a little bit about the shot spotter system based off of some of the work that I was doing this summer in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, where the district attorney was trying to get shot spotter put into uh, the town, uh, one of the towns in the county, and they had gotten a federal grant for it, uh, similar to what's going on in Newark, and uh, ultimately got voted down by the town council because there was a lot of these types of concerns of, you know, what if they were letting off fireworks? What about over policing this, that, and the other thing? And I would say that from my understanding is that those critiques, those worries are unfounded for the most part. Um, they don't really generate these, these, uh, false alarms that people are claiming or, or are super worried about they're pretty accurate and even so it, it say it is a car backfire the camera turns on the police see that there's nothing going on and they ignore it they don't they don't continue the investigation there now if you're worried about over policing quite frankly quite frankly i don't think it's the people in these communities the law-abiding people in these communities, I should say, that are that worried about this quote-unquote over-policing. No, they're more worried about if their kid is walking down the road, minding their own business, trying to get from school, and shots go off, and their kid actually gets hit. Guess what? It's right there on video. That person gets caught, and that kid gets saved. Okay? That's what these people should be worried about. And I think these critics and, and these these claims of 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 civil liberties being taken advantage of or over policing i think it's unfounded and it's ridiculous i think that and then they say you know it's it's predominantly affecting black populations and it's like maybe that's true because unfortunately in our socioeconomic atmosphere a lot of majority black neighborhoods are areas with a lot of high gun crime and gun violence and that's something that we should want to address and fix if we care about these communities which i'm proposing that we do and one way to do that is to stop gun violence from affecting these communities and one way of doing that is to get guns off the streets and when gunshots are fired we get there as quick as we possibly can to get those guns off the streets and the people using those guns off the streets as well i just don't think that the civil liberty defense de, um not defenses but but attacks against shot spotter hold any water because if you actually care about these communities guess what you want the guns off the street and this is an effective way to do so and i don't think it's a an overbearing way because the cameras aren't on 24 7 it's only they only turn on when those shots are fired all right a lot to digest so I, I think worth noting, the article does throw in an interesting figure. Uh, this is from uh, Dr. Anna Goldberg Sandow, a trauma surgeon at Cooper University Hospital in Camden. She said, quote, without shot spotter, emergency medical services took an average of 6.4 minutes to respond compared with 4.5 minutes when shot spotter was activated. These alerts can help first responders identify and assist gunshot victims who would otherwise not receive life-saving help. So I think on those grounds, like you said, there is certainly a very obviously clear and calculable utility to these services. Uh, on the over policing, uh, I would tend to agree with you. I don't think that it it is this like crazy, you know, uh, attack on the civil rights or civil liberties of the people in these communities. But I mean, my position always is, uh, has been, and, and will continue to be like. Uh, I think the the less interactions that I have or the less chance of an interaction that I have with a police officer, uh, the better. Uh, I really truthfully, uh, I don't want to see the police. I, I don't want to have to interact with, you know, the, the arm of the government uh, every corner that I turn. And I think just the visual of it might be unappealing to somebody who shares an opinion of mine. Uh, I don't like the notion that, you know, we're becoming more heavily surveilled or there's more tools that are going to you know, tune in and alert law enforcement to things happening where they are not present. I don't know if that's necessarily a direction that I want to take law enforcement in this country in the way that, you know, I think it should be used or, or employed. Uh, those facts aside, I think when you consider everything about this story, it's it's only a million dollar grant uh, and this exists in Newark. And if there's proven benefit to it, like we said, the increase in response time that is you know, allows EMS to render life-saving aid quicker and saves lives, 
I'm all for it. Um, so I, I think it's an important question, you know, and how you weigh those factors definitely, definitely is important. But at the end of the day, uh, you're talking two minutes and two minutes when you're dealing with a traumatic injury can quite literally mean life or death. And you have to acknowledge and accept, like you said, the reality that, you know, unfortunately, there these crimes are more likely to happen in areas, you know, some areas as opposed to others. And I think we owe it to the victims of these crimes, you know, when victims are present and able to be saved by this, that they get the best, most effective care as quickly as possible. And if this system advances that initiative, I, I'm entirely in support of it. So I, I think it'll be interesting. I Obviously, there's going to be plenty of discussion about this, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how people weigh those two factors, you know, the utility versus, you know, it feels like the cops are watching everything that I do, but that's always how it goes. I mean, it's always how it goes. I just think that the one side is completely, like, unwarranted in, in this scenario. I, I really do. I'll, like... Yeah. I don't know. It, it's just it's it's mind boggling to me because I feel like it's the same people that are arguing for gun control that are against shot spotter that are arguing, saying that we don't care about these people in these communities and their plight that are saying that that are seeming to be on the side of the people causing a lot of the plight, which are the people causing the gun violence, which are the people with the guns like it just it, it just doesn't. It seems like they are trying to fit. Uh, I don't even know. I, I don't even know how to explain it. It just seems like they're all over the map and it doesn't make any sense to me, quite frankly. I, I mean, fair enough. Fair enough. I, I think, like I said, somebody like me, I, I want to deal. I want to feel the presence of law enforcement as little as possible. I want minimum contact with uh, surveillance or, or anything of the sort. And I do think, I mean, there, there is some valid questions that are brought up and that are raised in the article where they say, well, what about, like you said, things like fireworks or, you know, cars that backfire that might accidentally trigger these things. And, and I understand your point where it's like, you know, if there's no crime, then you have nothing to worry about, but I just hate the idea, you know, it's that I could go out and have a good time with my friends, set off some fireworks, pop, 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 pop. And then all of a sudden, you know, I, I know also, somewhere there's an officer sitting down, saw my face, looking at me, cares about what I'm doing, and when it's truthfully none of his or her business. I That's also just me, think though. that that critique in this scenario is not necessarily a fair critique because the system is like – like that's that was a critique of the system at an earlier iteration. They've they've fixed those issues in this system where that doesn't really happen. And and I think that it's just like a reason to be scared. You know what I mean? Like they're just like throwing things at the wall, hoping it sticks so your spaghetti's done. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Leave the spaghetti out of this, please. <laughs> We got one last story and then we're wrapping it up here. And uh, it is from Utah Senator Mr. Mitt Romney. And we're going to play a quick audio clip that I think will give you the background of it. And then um, we'll talk briefly about it. In public service of one kind or another, at the end of another term, I'd be in my mid 80s, frankly, it's time for a new generation of leaders. They're the ones that need to make the decisions that will shape the world they will be living in. Now we face critical challenges, mounting national debt, climate change, and the ambitious authoritarians of Russia and China. Neither President Biden nor former President Trump are leading their party to confront those issues. On deficits and debt, both men refuse to address entitlements, even though they know that this represents two thirds of federal spending. Donald Trump calls global warming a hoax and President Biden offers feel good solutions that make no difference to the global climate. On China, President Biden underinvests in the military and President Trump underinvests in our alliances. Well, I think, you know, he goes on to just talk about the the why these old men shouldn't be in power and and the reason why 
he isn't seeking another term is because he is just right among them as he'll be 80 at the terms end, and he doesn't th he thinks it's time to pass the torch and i think that most americans uh, most americans i'd say agree with that um i think if you look at poll numbers uh most democrats don't want joe biden to run again because they think he's too old um, that doesn't seem to be as big of an issue with Republicans when it comes to Donald Trump, but because Donald Trump doesn't really seem like an old guy, if we're being honest, um, yeah. he's much more energetic. But like, let's not pretend that he isn't also very old. Um, he is. So I think that it's completely the right step for Mitt Romney. Personally, I think he probably should have retired from the Senate maybe before the last term or, or, or maybe the run before that or possibly the run before that he should have ended public life um not you know his his public his public life in government that is um but i think good on him most more people should follow him diane feinstein can barely walk and it's sad and she shouldn't be being rolled around the senate floor she should be retiring nancy pelosi is far too old to be in office i think mitch mcconnell we've all seen what he's been going through it's time to pass this on to the next generation and i commend mitt romney for realizing that now and um yeah so when i saw this i i was Beaming with joy, uh, as you know, Mitt Romney historically has been probably my favorite Republican. I know you'll contend that it's because he's not really a Republican at all, and that's why uh, he's my favorite. But nevertheless, I mean, the Mitt man Romney did has, make Obamacare. <laughs> hey, this man uh, has always, at least for my, as long as I've been able to perceive him in, in public sphere, has always uh, had my respect and admiration. I think that he is the best. Uh, that the Republican Party has had to offer in quite some time. And I think that he is very agreeable. And to your point, I, I think this is among the most agreeable things I've ever heard come out of uh, any politician's mouth in recent memory. He does a really excellent job at highlighting, you know, the deficiencies on both sides of the aisle. And I appreciate that he's always willing to kind of sling shots at Republicans, himself being a Republican. I, I think that if you're in politics, you're fair game for Mitt Romney, and I really respect that. I think the important takeaway, like you said, is his willingness to get ahead of the issue, which is, at for a lot of Americans, I think, frustrating that we have, like you said, in Dianne Feinstein, a woman who you know, does not have power of attorney. Her, her daughter is making health care decisions for her. Nancy Pelosi, who just came out and said that she's going to run for re-election again, who is, again, well into her 80s. Mitch McConnell, who you know, freezes and has these momentary lapses. Joe Biden, who falls and stumbles and, you know, re mis misrecollects, uh, I guess, stories about his life. And <laughs> That's a nice way to I'll say lie. He's been lying from the beginning, Stephen. He doesn't, he might really think they happened at this point. <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest. I, I will concede to you that Donald Trump doesn't seem like an old guy, but truth be told, he is, in his upper 70s, he is uh, an overweight gentleman who drinks Diet Coke and eats McDonald's. And, you know, his judgment hasn't always been the most sound thing either. So I, I think what Mitt Romney calls for and what he stands for is exactly the right message to send not only to the country at large, but to the youngest generation of people, which is it's your turn. It's time to take the mantle. It's time to, like you said, pass the torch, take it, run and address these issues that we've been trying to address, but neither party, you know, can satisfactorily, that's not a word, but you get what I'm saying, um, address. And I think it's a call to the new and next generation of political leaders and legislators and, you know, activists in this country to realize the moment that we're in and fully step into it. And I commend him for that. And I think it's a message worth echoing here. And I would say you and I, have stepped into our role. We've been, you know, quite the advocates for quite some time now and the participatory in a system that has been increasingly aging and bringing a fresh new take, a fresh new perspective uh, in a world that is so different than the world that the Mitt Romney's, Mitch McConnell's, Nancy Pelosi's grew up in is going to be essential towards addressing those challenges that he began to outline in that video. So uh, hats off to Mitch McConnell uh, and like I said, I think that that message is exactly what the nation needs to hear right now when we are being 
bombarded with so many other things in, in the public sphere and, and politics. And it was a breath of fresh air to have a politician who is sensible, make a really admirable call to action for the next generation of Americans. Yeah, I, I don't think I could add anything or say it any better than than that. Um, one thing about the baby boomers is that they don't know how to give up power at all. And I, I have to, you know, you have to give hats off to Mitt Romney for recognizing that and uh, and and understanding that there are other generations that are going to be here after you're gone, baby boomers. And it it's OK to relinquish your stranglehold on the power in this country because the next generations can handle the next generation's problems. Um, we like. The, and I don't want to discredit it. It's not like the baby boomers did all bad. It's not like they did nothing good. Um, you know, I, I think that a lot of the greatest innovations happened from people of the baby boomer generation that we are all thankful for today. Things like the communications we're having right now, our, our, you know, our cell phones, stuff like that um, wouldn't have been there without the the initiative and intuition of the baby boomer generation. But it's they're getting old. And sometimes, sometimes things pass you by um, and it's time to relinquish some power. I completely agree. But Steven, we got some stuff that we got to do. And unfortunately, like all good things, this episode too must come to an end. It is true. So, this has been another episode of Bridging the Gap. You can get more Jersey First content on jerseyfirst.org where you can sign up for our newsletter and sign up for the pledge. You can check us out on Jersey First TV on YouTube where you can hit that notification bell and subscribe to get all of your Jersey First content. That's Real Talk with Fernando. That's The Nader Narrative. That's Bridging the Gap. You can check us out on, on NJ on demand anytime on nj.com at Bridging the Gap. So thanks for tuning in, everybody. We'll talk to you next week. I'm AJ. Malillo. I'm Steven. Rambolo. <laughs> Peace out, everybody.